Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of To The Point with me, Frank Pereira on Rajya Sabha Television. The Surrogacy Regulation Bill of 2016 has set the cat amongst the pigeons, if you would like to call it that, uh, as far as the medical tourism sector in India is concerned. What is it? How is it going to affect the medical tourism sector? And how is it going to affect several women in India who look uh, you know, to be surrogate mothers and make a livelihood out of it. That's what we're going to try and find out uh, in the next half an hour or so. Joining me on the program today to talk about this is uh, eminent legal scholar and uh, former member of the Law Commission, Professor Tahir Mahmood. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the, the proposed, you know, surrogacy regulation bill is concerned, what are your thoughts on it, Professor? Let me tell you that this bill has been drafted in response to a law commission report. And I was a member of the commission when this uh, report was submitted to the government. But it was done in a great hurry. We had our term until 31st of August 2009. And this report was submitted on 5th of August. So it was uh, uh, written in a hurry by our chairman. The practice in the Law Commission of India is that if the chairman or an individual member prepares a report and then that report is discussed in the Law Commission meeting and if it is unanimously approved by everybody, then it is sent to the government as the commission report. If there is uh, any uh, dissenting uh, opinion, then it is not adopted. This report was never discussed in, in the commission. It was written by uh, the chairman, Justice A.R. Lakshman. And I was the only full-time member of the commission. 18th Law Commission was unique in this matter. It had only the chairman and one member. And there were part-time members, six or seven part-time members. But uh, no meeting was convened to discuss it. It was sent to me for signatures by the uh, chairman. Uh, I had uh, difference of opinion on certain points. But the major, the thrust of the report was that there should be a regulatory legislation, that uh, it's being uh, commercially exploited in the country to the detriment of uh, women and children, and so there should be a regulatory legislation. So that was the, uh, the focal point in the report. I signed it, and the commission has not recommended that uh, um, the uh, surrogacy, practice of surrogacy, should either be banned or should be legalized. This is not the recommendation of the Commission. The Commission has only said that if it remains in existence, it has to be legally regulated. Mm. That's all. Mm. And uh, Medical Council of India had made some recommendations before the Law Commission uh, took it up. So a more to, there was no reference from the government on this point to the Law Commission. The Medical Council of India had drafted a bill. That bill we took up, so a more to, uh, a cognizance, and we uh, prepared this report and sent it to the government, giving our opinion on the major points of the bill. Our recommendation was there must be a regulatory legislation, leaving it to the government what else it would want to do. In its present form, of course, the cabinet has cleared it. Now it remains to pass the parliament hurdle. In its present form, do you think that it's going to help the country? It's going to help uh, the several women, of course, who are looking to be surrogate mothers to earn a livelihood out of it? Or is it going to, you know, act as a detriment? No, it's uh, full of lacuna and it, it needs to be properly discussed and the best uh, uh, way to do it will be to refer it to a select committee, parliamentary select committee and that select committee must uh, invite public opinion and take evidence in, from different uh, sections of the, of the society. It, it cannot be hurried up and uh, quickly passed because it does suffer from many legal and other lacuna. You know, as far as the bill is concerned, the proposed bill is concerned, only altruistic surrogacy is going to be allowed. So what happens to the $2.3 billion industry of uh, the surrogacy tourism in our country? Well, there is a, a serious point to be, to be pondered, and that is that in many foreign countries, uh, surrogacy is prohibited by, yes. by law. Their citizens come to India to have a surrogate, a surrogate child. And... Uh, why? Why? If their country doesn't allow it in their own country, then they should. Those countries should prohibit it also in 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 India. India. But the bill prohibits um, surrogacy by foreigners. Uh, that is a serious point to be considered. But apart from that, it allows only married couples 
who are infertile and who have been married five, for five years. Only they can adopt a child. I can't understand why a person in normal circumstances would, would want to have a surrogate child. Unmarried people are not allowed. Uh, live in relationship, excluded from the scope of uh, surrogacy. Um, homosexual relationship, excluded. So normal persons, why will they go in for surrogacy? Just for inf infertility? How many people are uh, can be placed in that section? Infertile, married people, married for five years, having no child. So this bill is not going to benefit a large number of uh, um, uh, members of the society. It needs to be, to be reconsidered. Surrogacy is not a natural thing to be recommended or adopted in natural circumstances. That cannot be allowed. It has to be only in uh, exceptional circumstances. And in all exceptional circumstances, uh, the bill is going to prohibit it. Critics have called it draconian. Would you agree with it? I wouldn't call it draconian, but uh, well, it's, a, it's a rather uh, unusual type of bill which places too many recommendations, too many restrictions, unnecessary restrictions, and ignores many, many things which need to be provided in the bill. You know, we spoke about how gay couples are not allowed to get a surrogate child. We've spoken about how only uh, married couples who are infertile and have been married for five years are allowed to go in for a yes. surrogate child. Mm. So then, but then to the defense of the government, we would say that the Indian law itself does not accept a gay relationship or a live-in relationship. So hence, uh, they have been left out. That's what our foreign minister said, it, as reported in the press, that Indian law does not recognize a live-in relationship or a gay relationship. But gay relationship has just been decriminalized by the judiciary. And uh, that's, that's a big story. Everybody knows about it. The Delhi High Court decriminalized, they declared uh, Section 377 yes. of the Indian Penal Code to be uh, unconstitutional. And then the matter went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had, had a different opinion. But uh, there is a, a great uh, section, very large section of the society, which agrees with the decriminalization of homosexuality. Live-in relationship is recognized by legislation. Domestic Violence Act recognizes live-in relationship for all the benefits uh, on the same footing as for a wife. So to say that Indian law does not recognize uh, these things uh, is not accurate. Of course, Indian social ethos, Indian religions, they do not recognize these things. But are we going to enforce religions or uh, cultural ethos of the people? That's a big uh, issue for debate. You know, the health minister and the external affairs minister have said that once this bill comes into being, the lives of several thousand Indian women are going to be better. But then, to the, to the, you know, looking at the other side of the coin, these women look for surrogacy to try and earn their livelihood, to try and get their money, and several of them are happy with the 75,000 or 1 lakh that they get out of this. It is the poor women, really, who go in for such kind of an arrangement. Yeah, it's a profession. It has it become a profession in India, and many other undesirable professions are legal in this country. So why to stop this as a profession? Uh, this also requires a debate. And they have a point that if foreigners can come here and adopt a child, why can't they go in for a surrogate child? That is permitted by, by the law. In fact, uh, uh, in my personal opinion, the uh, solution to all these problems will be to uh, have a surrogacy law, limited surrogacy law, allow surrogacy in very exceptional cases, and instead promote the other laws. We have the law of guardianship, Guardians and Wards Act of 1890 which allows the foreigners to come here and seek guardianship of uh, Indian children, take them to their countries, and there start the proceedings for adoption. Then we have the uh, adoption laws in this country, which allow foreigners to come and adopt Indian children. Those laws should be promoted. They need to be promoted. The, the government has just enacted, parliament has just enacted a new Juvenile Justice Act yes. in 2015. In juvenile, earlier Juvenile Justice Act, there was one uh, small brief section on adoption. They have now expanded it. There is a full chapter under the new uh, Juvenile Justice Act uh, 2015. 
but then adoption is allowed under this act only for or, uh, orphaned, abandoned, surrendered children, that is all. Why? Why should the choice of people be limited to orphaned, abandoned and surrendered children? Uh, the a more liberal law on adoption and a more liberal law on guardianship rights uh, are the need of the day in this country, in my personal opinion, than a surrogacy law. So as far as the surrogacy law is concerned, do you see several roadblocks coming up along the way? Yes, they are. They, are, and they, and they need to be discussed and uh, all the stakeholders, they have to be invited to uh, take part in the debate. And a consensus, a fairly good consensus must emerge before the law is enacted. Rather than banning it completely in terms of, you can almost call it a ban because there's just one, you know, one section of people who are allowed to get a surrogate and child. And a very of, small section. Yes, a very small section. And that too, they have to find a relative. Yes. And a close relative. Yes. Not necessarily blood relative, but a close relative. And you must not pay anything to them. So who will come forward and say, oh, all right, I want to be the mother of your child? You know, under similar circumstances where countries have banned surrogacy, such kind of altru altruistic uh, surrogacy has failed mm. and that's why they come to India. Mm. So what's, you know, what's to say that it's going to succeed in India? That's what I was uh, meaning to say when I said that uh, many foreigners in their country it is not allowed. So they come to India looking for greener pasture and they, by spending some peanuts they, they get a surrogate mother here. But the other side of the coin is that that surrogate mother for, for her, this money is, is a fortune. So very difficult questions have to be answered, to be debated, pondered over and answered. And the law cannot be passed in, in a hurry. Indeed, the law cannot be passed in a hurry. A lot of discussion and deliberation is required. Like, yes. Let's, let's move on now and talk about some other aspects of the law and one issue that has been coming up time and again and is always discussed in the media, be it television, be it print, is the Uniform Civil Code. I want to know your thoughts on the Uniform Civil Code. Unfortunately, those who talk of a Uniform Civil Code, whether they are politicians or, or uh, um, we do apologies to you, media persons, they don't know what a Uniform Civil Code means. They have either not read the provision of Article 44 of the Constitution of India, or if they have read, they have not understood it. Let me tell you that reading the language used in Article 44 and reading in between the lines, in the light of the background in, in which uh, this provision had to be added in the Constitution of India, there is, I am saying it with full sense of responsibility, there is no directive in the Constitution for Parliament to enact a uniform civil code. Mm. The directive is for the state, and state means legislature, executive and judiciary. And the directive is for uh, endeavouring, the words used are, the state shall endeavour to secure a uniform civil code. The idea is not that one single code of uh, family law should be enacted by Parliament and imposed on everybody, all communities in supersession of their personal law. That is not the idea. The idea is that the government must reform the laws, existing laws. And while reforming them, they must try for uniformity. The laws should be reformed as long, as much as possible on, uniform, on a uniform basis. This is what Article 44 says. So the, but everybody thinks that the, the directive is parliament should enact uh, one single law called Uniform Civil Code and uh, apply it to all communities in supersession of their personal laws. So it's a faulty understanding of the provision of the constitution. And it has nothing to do, a lot of people talk about it on, on the, on the uh, visual media or even in print media. They link it to nationalism. This absolutely nonsense. It has nothing to do with nationalism. It's a, it's a, uh, a social reform provision in the constitution. It's a uh, law, uh, you can say, a pro-women provision or pro-children uh, provision. And it only uh, tells the government that in future, whatever laws the government may, the government must make laws for social reform. That's provided in Article 25 that the religious freedom will not come in the way of social reform. Article 25 declares it in so yes. many words. 
So, the government must uh, do all its, its best to introduce social reforms by reforming the various uh, family laws which are now in existence, whether they are general laws applicable to everybody like the Child Marriage Restraint Act or whether they are community specific personal laws like the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955 or the, or the Muslim law. There is no difference between the two. So, whichever uh, law is there, uh, uh, state must reform it in the interest of the society. And while reforming these laws, uniformity must, must be, be kept there. in mind. Yes. This is the message of the constitution. Is the atmosphere right to have a uniform civil code at the moment? I have already answered you that uh, a uniform civil code is not even required by the constitution. Mm. But uh, there are laws which apply to various communities and they are full of lacuna. The, what is known as Hindu Code, the four Hindu law acts of 1955-56, Hindu Marriage Act, Hindu uh, Succession Act, Minority and Guardianship Act, Adoption and Maintenance Act, enacted by Parliament of Secular India six years after the introduction of the Constitution, uh, enforcement of the Constitution containing a provision for Uniform Civil Code. These four laws are much more discriminatory than the Muslim law or the, or the Christian law on certain points. So all these laws, they have to be taken up in consideration. Generally, people think that uh, uniform civil code is a euphemism for Hindu law, modern mm. Hindu law. Mm. But modern Hindu law is, is itself very faulty and full of uh, religion-based and, and uh, gender-based discriminations. So these are the things to be, to be uh, taken care of by, by the state. Uh, uniform civil code, in the sense of one single code, is not required by the constitution and will never be possible. At least not for another hundred years to come, it won't be possible. And you know, talking but, about... But uh, personal laws must be reformed and all personal laws are crying for reform under the uh, Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act. If you are married and you want to adopt a child and your wife is also a Hindu or Buddhist or Sikh or Jain, you must obtain her permission. If your wife is a Christian, you need not consult her. You can um, adopt a child against her wishes without consulting her. And not only adopt, you can give her a child in adoption to someone else without consulting her. This is what the, a modern law enacted by parliament says in 19, enacted in 1956. This is not, and nobody talks about it, these things. I have given you just one uh, example. Uh, there are many provisions like this in the in the Hindu law, then Muslim personal law is being misinterpreted, misused, misunderstood in the society like hell. Majority of people, dominant majority of people, both Muslims and non-Muslims, misunderstand it, misuse it and misinterpret it. That needs to be attended to. It's a, it's a crying need of the, of the time. It must be attended to. Similarly, uh, um, reforms are required. In those laws, which do apply to everybody, the government, uh, parliament has enacted many laws which are in the direction of a uniform civil code. It's not that there is no law in this country which applies to uh, every, every Indian citizen. We have the Guardians and Wards Act, we have the Dowry Prohibition Act, we have uh, the, this uh, uh, um, Child Marriage Restraint Act, we have the Senior Citizen Maintenance of Parents and Senior Citizens Act enacted as late as 2007. So, to say that the state has not moved in the direction of a uniform civil code is not correct. Many law, uniform laws have been enacted and that is the answer to the, to the uh, constitutional uh, provision relating to uniform civil code. The state is gradually moving in that direction, it should be speeded up. Indeed. More uniform uh, laws should be, should be enacted uh, gradually and in the meanwhile, the laws which are existing, uh, they should be reformed. If enacting a single uniform law of, on any family law subject for everybody was possible, then tell me, in 1954 the government, the parliament enacted the law of civil marriages, secular marriages for everybody, 1954. One year later, what was the need for enacting a Hindu marriage act separately? Within one year, by enacting a separate Hindu marriage act, parliament had in principle, state in principle, had accepted that this is not the, the demand of article 44 of the constitution, that there should be no uh, 
uh, other law except one single law to be applied to everybody. Otherwise, the Special Marriage Act was there. Indian Succession Act 1925 was there. What was the need for Hindu Succession Act? Minorities and Guardianship Act, Hindu Minorities and Guardianship Act 1956, it was an act. What was the need? There was the Guardians and Wars Act 1890. So the state has been conscious of the difficulties and so it is moving slowly. The speed for moving towards a uniform family law regime needs to be uh, uh, to be attended to. It, the, the, it has to be speeded up. Yes, it has to be expedited. And you Ex know, yes. as far as uniform civil code is concerned, we've seen that every time it is brought up, the issue becomes extremely emotive, and then you know it gets a lot of coverage in the media as well. Why do you think it happens? I, I told you because it is uh, being very irrationally linked to issues like nationalism, patriotism, and uh, the real purpose behind the provision of the, con of the constitution relating to uniform civil code is being ignored. And it becomes a majority-minority issue. To be more precise, it becomes a Hindu-Muslim issue in, in uh, TV debates uh, and in, in, in media debates. This has to be checked. This, this uh, trend has to be stopped. There is a uh, legal provision in the Constitution of India. Its demands, its meaning, its uh, background, its uh, uh, requirements, its implications, they are to be properly appreciated. I am happy that the issue has been referred to the Law Commission of India and I hope that the Law Commission will uh, undertake the exercise of properly explaining to the state what actually is the provision of the uh, Constitution of India and what should be done in this respect. The priority must be for the reform of personal law or per all personal laws need to be reformed. You know, when you, when you were a part of the Law Commission, what were some of the recommendations that you made? Were those recommendations really implemented? I personally wrote four reports in the domain of family law. There were other reports also, but in the domain of family law, I report four reports. Three were sent to the government, not implemented. Nothing uh, in those reports was implemented. The fourth was rejected by the commission itself. That was on Muslim law. It was on the Sharia Act of 1937. I wanted it to be streamlined, but it was a report leaked to the press. There was a big hue and cry from the Muslim community and our uh, illustrious Chairman Justice Lakshmanan said, no, it's a controversial issue, we should not take it up. Now, if only because if it's a controversial issue, if only because if the community is shy of uh, getting its personal law reform, organizations like the Law Commission of India sh should feel shy of uh, making a proposal for that, it's the crux of the problem. We do, should not bother about what the communities or the uh, orthodox elements, religious elements, and, in those communities are saying, nobody listens to the progressive uh, voices within the Muslim community, within other communities. Nobody, the government has never asked me, what is your viewpoint? I, Suomoto, gave my viewpoint in a report for the Law Commission of India and it was rejected at the commission level itself. And nobody questioned the chairman why you are not uh, approving it and sending it to the, to the government. And finally, of course, before I let you go, uh, another issue that has been in the media and that the Supreme Court has taken up is the triple talaq issue. Several petitions have been filed in the Supreme Court about it. Which way do you see it headed? Because the Supreme Court has given the government uh, four weeks to respond. Look, a triple talaq, the way it is understood in this society, is an absurdity. It's an absolutely an absurdity. It is uh, before examining whether it is unconstitutional, it should be seen whether it is in accordance with the Quran or not, whether it is in accordance with the basic sources of Islamic law. There is no mention of triple talaq in the, in the uh, constitution. It was an innovation made during the early years of Islam, which was uh, very much disliked, disapproved, condemned by the Prophet and by, by his successors. And the problem is in India, the general understanding in the Muslim community is that this is the only way of uh, getting rid of the wife, mm. triple talaq, which is absurd. It's not the only way. It's actually no way. It is, it's a uh, misinterpretation of the, of the ancient laws. And so the, uh, the judiciary in deciding this case should look into not only the constitutional provisions, the 
uh, query should be not whether it is unconstitutional, that should also be taken into consideration, but the major query has to be whether it is Islamic or not. It is absolutely un-Islamic, it has been prohibited all over the world in Muslim countries by legislation. And the other issue is the issue of polygamy, that too is being raised in the Supreme Court. Yeah, it, it's the same uh, for polygamy. Uh, uh, polygamy is actually not the real problem of the Muslim society in India. It may be preval prevalent in some other countries, but in the Muslim society of India, polygamy is not a problem. It's not being generally practiced. You will be surprised to know that the percentage of uh, bigamous husbands in the Muslim society is lesser than in other societies whose laws prohibit uh, uh, polygamy. So it's not a, a, a big problem for the Muslim. But in any case, if polygamy is prohibited by law, it won't be a violation of Islamic law because it's only uh, 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 permissible in Islam and it was permitted 1400 years ago in the circumstances of the time. And then also it was per, uh, permitted subject to certain very strict conditions and it's absolutely impossible to follow those strict conditions in the present day society. And therefore, I personally be believe if, if Prophet Muhammad had been alive today, he would himself have had prohibited polygamy. All right, we've come to the end of the program, Professor. Thank you so much for joining us on uh, To The Point uh, this uh, week and sharing your expertise and your expert views on several of those subjects that we discussed. It was a pleasure having you on the program. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much for watching. See you again next time.